Hey everybody, this is Chris Thompson, and welcome to session number 11 of Brain Software with Dr. Mike Mandel. He's had five operations on his hands, four root canals, and once actually performed surgery on himself. <laughs> Mike? Yes, Chris, I did once perform surgery on myself. I cut out a cyst without the aid of any anesthetic uh, from a rather sensitive area of the body, a rather large cyst, and my own family doctor took a look at it, and he said, you did a really good job. Well, and since you're not a medical doctor, right, I suppose you can't sue yourself on malpractice. That's good. That's a very good point. <laughs> All right. So we're back here for session number 11. We got a lot of question and answer content that we want to go through today. And we're just going to jump right into it. How do you feel about that, Mike? Good yep, for you? Let's take it away. Okay, so I know that we made some notes, and the first one is actually a question that came from a former student of yours, Marlene, in Waterloo, Ontario. So let me just turn it over to you. Why don't you explain the question and uh, how it applies to hypnosis? Yeah, this is something, Chris, that came in by phone, not by email. Marlene was one of my hypnosis students a number of years ago. Very good student. And she phoned me, and I, I finally got back to her. I was busy for a few days and spoke to her today. And her question was such a good one, I thought we should maybe address it. She was taken in by a telephone scam and wondered how she had fallen for it because she said partway through the scam, she was pretty sure it was a scam and still let them trick her with it. So here, here's the basic thing. I, I think this is the same um, joker who phoned you or, or one of the... I get many of them yes, calling me yes. all the time. Yes, I know. I know you enjoy dealing with them. But what happened was this person phoned, claimed to be calling from Microsoft and said that um, there were problems with her computer. And Oh, yeah. The you have a virus scam. That's the one. And mm. it, of course, it didn't work with you because you have a Mac. Yeah. <laughs> and they're <laughs> telling the guy along for a long time and then finally told him, you're saying I have a virus on my Mac? And then he hung up on me. Instantly. Well, Marlene does not have a Mac. And what happened was... Uh, the guy strung her along and, and told her there were problems with her computer, and he got her on the phone on her computer. I don't know if she shut off the firewall or whatever, gave this company access to her computer, and she wound up having to cancel all her credit cards, and it's just been a nightmare for her. And she said, I mean, I mean this isn't a program about computer fraud, but it's why did she fall for it when she said she felt pulled to do what the guy said, even though she began to suspect that it was indeed a fraud. And I reconstructed it with her. And I, it, it, I determined fairly quickly that she had fallen for a yes set and a compliance set. I was going to guess that. Yes. And for those of you who are not familiar with it, good salespeople do this just intuitively. But a yes set basically builds positive momentum. And all you have to do is get the person internally or externally saying yes or agreeing with you three to five times. And from that, you then move to a compliance set, which is getting them to obey you without question, even on just minor, minor things. And what happens is it removes your resistance and very quickly you can essentially fall under their spell. And what he had probably said was something like, oh, you have a computer uh, with Windows on it? Yes. Have you ever had an error message in the last couple of weeks? Yes. Uh, are you in the room with your computer now? Yes. Okay, I want you to switch on your monitor if it isn't switched on. Okay, I've done it. Uh, could you check this file? Okay. So she's gone from saying yes to complying with what he said and before long, she has continued down that road and is now giving a total stranger over the phone access to her computer. And that's how powerful the yes set and the compliance set is. That's a really interesting story. I didn't follow that scam along far enough, obviously, to see how they worked it. But um, I was just trying to pull up the website. I'm not going to interrupt our recording to go and find the website. But I was using some software recently called Time Doctor. And I think if you go to timedoctor.com, you can probably see it. And this is time tracking software. So if you have employees working for you in another region, like I have a few people working for me, then you want to see how they're spending their time. Anyway, the landing page is really clever because it starts by just throwing three questions at you. And they're very simple questions like, do you believe that your employees are wasting at least 30 minutes a day? Yes, yes or no? <laughs> and of course, you, you go, yes, because I know I waste at least 30 minutes a day. At least. And then it's something else. Like, do you believe that... I don't know, that it would be worth $10 a month to recover 30 minutes a day. And well, simple math. Yes, of course it would. And by the time you get to the third question, they offer you, you know, try using our software free for 30 days and boom, you're sucked and in. And then the fourth question is, what is your credit card number? Exactly. And anyway, it's a, it's a brilliant way to convince people to do things. So the power of a yes set and a compliance set absolutely works. Yes. And I used to use it uh, fairly frequently in hypnosis sessions. And 
I teach all my students to do that. Just ask some questions that they're absolutely going to answer yes to. So things like, oh, it's a bright, sunny day, isn't it? You mm-hmm. know, and if it's a bright, sunny day, they're going to say yes, or at least nod or agree internally. And if you see them, you know, I might look out the window of my office and I'd see them getting out of a little red Honda. I'd say, is that your red Honda out there? Yes. Okay, you're here to make some changes, aren't you? Yes. Okay, let's begin now. And by using a yes set and sometimes a compliance set would be able to segue them into that. So you really have to watch out for this. A clever salesperson, anyone making any kind of pitch, if they can get you to agree, create an agreement frame through a yes set three to five times, typically they have the metaphorical foot in the door already. And I just want to ask you about the fine points of this, Mike. If you use a yes set first, then you build up more leverage for your compliance set, do you not? Yes, the yes set is critical to use first because it it um, is the easiest one to get open, op- mm-hmm. begin to open the door first. If you use a yes set, it's much easier to get someone to agree or say yes than to actually do something. Right. And in very rare cases, maybe half a dozen times in 30 odd years, I would use a no set, which is getting the person to say no to discharge resistance. But you almost never have to use that. So if somebody was very resistant, you know, you don't even want to be here today, do you? No. And you think it's probably not going to work, is it? No. So let them say no a few times to discharge their resistance in a safe manner. And then, but you are here, aren't you? Yes. And your parents have brought you here for some good reason. Yes. And they have paid money for me to help you. Yes. So we might as well do something, right? Yes. Okay, put your feet flat on the floor, fold your hands in your lap, take a deep breath. There's your compliance at trans now, but not if you're driving. Exactly. And I'll just point out to everyone that I learned the no set from Mike, and I worked that into my course talking to toddlers dealing with the terrible twos and beyond. And no sets work really well with kids. You don't want to put on your coat and go outside, do you? No. No. You don't want to get in the car. No. No. And you don't want to be in the car driving for a long time. No. But you do want to go and visit grandma, and you're going to have lots of fun when you're there, won't you? Yes. So let's just get on that coat and that car seat, and we'll just get that drive over with now fantastic and for those of you who are not familiar with it if you do have young kids or have friends or family members who have young kids check out chris thompson's program talking to toddlers where chris has taken the best of neurolinguistic programming and hypnotic language patterns you're not going to be trancing your kid out but you're going to be speaking to them very very influentially getting rid of a lot of um, crises that you don't need and tantrums and all kinds of problems and at the same time you'll be teaching your child about cause and effect and how language works and you'll be building very very strong bonds with them check out talking to toddlers i highly recommend this program well thanks and you know i had a pretty good teacher <laughs> the uh yes the, what's really funny is or funny to me is I, I i never really want to explain to people that we're using tools that come from hypnosis on children because i don't want them freaking out thinking oh you're gonna you're gonna trance out a child you can use hypnosis on a child well yes and no we're not really using hypnosis but of course everything is hypnosis so Yes, we are using tools that come from hypnosis because hypnosis is just a way to communicate. Right. And I think with a case like that, I'd be inclined to lead towards the lean towards the neurolinguistic aspect of it. So they're thinking it's something to do with words and language, which, of course, it is. But then again, neurolinguistic programming came out of hypnosis. That was one third of it. Right. And, And so on a podcast like this, where the audience is obviously interested in the topic of hypnosis, I have uh, no discomfort in talking about it. But clearly to, not, because you've just mentioned it about 1500 <laughs> times. To my normal audience, it's, uh, I, I still think there's a lot of people out there who have no clue as to what hypnosis is. They think it's some weird foreign thing and uh, they get very, very spooked by it. Anyway, those of you who are listening clearly don't have that problem and are for further along than 99 percent of the population i love the way you invoke the word foreign there chris just to bring in the xenophobia <laughs> all right i think we've had enough talking about tele- telemarketer scams or maybe not we'll come back to that actually i have some ideas for later mike but okay. let's move on i think um i want to talk about this one newton from new york he sent in a really interesting question and i know you're going to like this one he says mike do you have any experience with lucid dreaming and how it can be triggered now i wanted to save this for the podcast because i know you have done some work with lucid dreaming and i thought you would love the chance to talk about it yes absolutely chris we're back to the am i a man dreaming he's a butterfly or Am I a butterfly dreaming he's a man? Lucid dreaming is a fantastic topic. And this segues into the reality tunnels that we mentioned a few podcasts back, looking at the work of Robert Anton Wilson. And I was talking about drifting off to sleep with a teddy bear in a cool room, um, nice and cozy in the bed and putting on a maybe a 
a nature sound like waves or rain or something like that, and building in the hypnagogic state before wakefulness and full sleep arrives, a storyline that then continues within the dream. Well, lucid dreaming is very, very closely related to this, but it does go somewhat further. Lucid dreaming, for those of you not familiar with the concept, is essentially waking up to the fact that you are dreaming while still remaining asleep. And it's a remarkable thing when it happens. I recall the very first time as a kid, um, I was sitting in our, my bedroom. So this would be Scarborough, Ontario. So I was probably about 13, 14. And I remember one night I couldn't sleep. And I just turned on this little black and white TV back then and started watching. And it was something come out of Calgary, on um, Calgary, Alberta, and it was called Stampede Wrestling. And I watched this wrestling program for about two hours until I was exhausted. And then I lay down and tried to get back to sleep again. And I was lying there with my eyes closed. And I remember thinking... Boy, that's stupid. I wasted two hours when I could be sleeping. What a dumb thing to do. I got to get up for school tomorrow. And I went, wait a minute. I don't even have a TV in my room. I must have been asleep. And then I went, but wait a minute. I haven't done anything different. I must still be asleep now. And at that moment, I realized I was still dreaming and jarred myself awake. But I, I woke up for the very first time within a dream and recognized I was dreaming. And since then began to pursue different methods of creating lucid dreams. I remember you explained to me one time, uh, we were driving back from jiu-jitsu class, I think you were dropping me off at the subway. And you were explaining to me three methods which, which you, you could use to recognize that you were lucid dreaming or trigger it. Do you, do you remember that conversation? Yes. Um, the, Something to do with a clock yes, or a light it, switch? Or... It's a fairly typical method. A great way of triggering lucid dreaming is one of the first things you can do is start to track your dreams. So keep either a small recorder or a piece of paper and a pen, little notepad next to your bed. And if you awaken in the night for any reason, immediately jot down the notes on what you were dreaming. And what you're beginning to do is bridge the sleep state to the waking state. And just doing that alone will increase the propensity for lucid dreams. Now, why would you want to have a lucid dream to begin with? Well, the wonderful thing is when you wake up in a dream, the first few times you'll be so freaked out by it that you'll jar yourself awake. But after a while, you learn to stay calm and the wonderful thing is you can then direct the dream in any direction you choose. If you want to fly or become Superman or go through walls or all sorts of nonsense that we won't discover, discuss on a family rated show. But basically one can do almost anything. So it's a useful experience and it is completely real and vivid. So the first thing is beginning to track your dreams. And the second thing is you can, anytime you walk into a room look at a light switch and flick the light switch and say, am I dreaming? Now, it doesn't matter if it's a table lamp or a wall light, whatever, because your brain seems to be unable to get lighting really, really good in dreams. A couple of things it falls short on in its RAM. It's not great at producing text. It's not great at lighting. And time tends to go all over the place in dreams. So you mess with these three things. So every time I'd walk into a room, I'd flick the light switch and look at it and say, am I dreaming? And normally the light goes on normally and I realize I'm not dreaming. But other times it's not so normal. Eventually you turn on the light and you say, am I dreaming? And something weird will happen with the light. And you realize you are dreaming. You've transferred this action into your dreams and begin to continue doing this. It's a way of recognizing you're dreaming. The other one is to look at print, at text, a newspaper. You look at the newspaper and you say, am I dreaming? Every time you look at fine print... And if you're dreaming, the print will move all over. It'll go strange. And you go, oh, shoot, I'm dreaming. And you wake up and you go, oh, darn, I almost had it. And the third one is a clock. Anytime you see a time on a clock, stare at it and ask yourself, am I dreaming? And if you are, the clock will do something weird. It'll run backwards or phase in or out. So you just pick one of these and do it consistently. And before long, you'll be experiencing lucid dreaming. Okay, that's really cool. So I, at least I was correct. I remembered two of the three things. Yes, I forgot yes. the text one. So... How does a lucid dream help you? Does it help you? Is it just fun? It's just fun. I mean, it's, it's like the hypnagogic states and transferring those into dreams. My point is, if you got to sleep anyway, why not have a blast? You know, like, why not have an adventure while you're sleeping? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I really have started to enjoy catching myself in that hypnagogic state. It used to freak me out because... I've probably said this to you before, Mike, but the way I describe it is it's like you're lying in bed and you're just thinking about normal everyday things. And then all of a sudden they just transform into something that makes no sense whatsoever. Right, right. And that, I mean, I caught myself just last night in that state 
and usually it jars me out of it, but now I'm, I'm more comfortable with it. So what's happened is I'll just lie there and go, wow, I'm in that hypnagogic state. Well, that was weird. And I'll just cycle in and out for like a few minutes. And then finally I fall asleep. My wife always reports to me that I passed out instantly. But the truth is I was just enjoying this hypnagogic this state. This drifting kind of thing. Yes, yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. And it has really helped me be able to go to sleep extremely fast. That's fantastic. And of course, self-hypnosis is also a tremendous trigger for lucid dreaming. I'm, I'm really considering that when we get our next product out, which as you know is dealing with insomnia, actually beyond insomnia, called Getting a Good Night's Sleep, and uh, it's going to be extremely comprehensive. I've got about half of it written now and researched it thoroughly. Now, when that is done, I'm wondering if we should just create a track for inducid, inducing lucid dreams. And even if we don't do it as a product, maybe we'll give it as an add-on for somebody who buys something else. Well, let's leave that to the listeners for your feedback. If you want something like that, let us know. Questions at MikeMandelHypnosis.com. And yeah. in this case, it's answers. But <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but please keep the emails coming in. We do read all of them. Uh, we do respond to all of them. It does take us a while to do so because typically a new podcast comes out every two weeks. Right. Okay, um, that answers the question on lucid dreaming. That was really interesting. So let's move to the next one, which was from Dean in Mississauga. And this is a good question. He says, what do you recommend to quickly build rapport with a group when giving a speech or a presentation? And I know that you answered him by email with a, a brief response and said, look, I can't do this justice with an email, so I'll save it for a podcast. So here we are. Well, the number one thing I use for dealing with a group is humor, first of all, because as soon as you have humor in any context, Grinder said it unlocks the model and the learning curve becomes almost vertical. When we're laughing, when we're having fun, we're in an extremely resourceful state. So I don't mean get up there and be a stand-up comic, but anything you can do to alleviate any kind of tension by bringing humor into the situation will immediately start to generate rapport with the audience. Another thing you can do is to fire off states of curiosity. Always imply things that you're going to talk about and give hints of things that are going to be coming up that sound particularly interesting because curiosity is a state where all sensory channels open wide and are waiting for information. So if you have humor and curiosity firing together, and if you are congruent, if your body language, your internal dialogue, your words, your tonality, if everything is sending the same message, you will send a very, very clear pattern that other people can bond with and build bridges with and create rapport. Typically, I'm always going to attempt to build rapport with the leader in the group. So if I'm presenting to a business group and someone there is the big boss who introduces me or whatever, he's the one I'll be glancing at and getting him to nod and smile and so on back and forth, which then will cause the rest of the group to be drawn in. A number of years ago, I had a meeting with a company, Jumbo Video. I don't know if they exist anymore. Probably not. And they rented video cassettes out. And I was going to do a brain software keynote for them. And I had a meeting in the boardroom with the head honcho and um, some of his employees, and I was there with two of my agents, and when he sat down at the table, he was wearing jeans, he was completely relaxed, and everybody else was all rigid and freaked out, so I mirrored him. I slumped and acted like he did, and he had a don't-give-a-toss attitude, so I had the same attitude, and just built rapport with him, and my agent thought I was being slovenly and not paying attention, and he really liked me and hired me right away. So, again, find the dominant person, build rapport with the dominant person. We're looking at martial arts in reverse, which, of course, is attack the dominant person. And in martial arts, when you attack the dominant person, the rest of the group tends to fold. Likewise, if you, likewise, if you build rapport with the dominant person in a group, you will build rapport with the group. I, uh, I really like hearing that example. I think that makes a lot of sense. I had a question about storytelling because you, you mentioned that when you're delivering a presentation, you want to be very congruent. And if you want to build rapport and if you want to use curiosity and um, <laughs> I lost my train of thought there, but what was the other thing you said? Oh, humor, right? <laughs> if, if you're going to use humor and curiosity, often I find that you're very congruent because you tell stories from your real life experiences, just like you do at the end of the podcast. You tell yes. stories. Um, do you, how do you recommend people start bringing stories into their own presentations? Draw from your own life. Uh, Milton Erickson always drew from his own experience because our own lives are rich enough with metaphor, example, fascinating anecdotes. Find the stories that you are living 
and they will have a profound effect on other people if you tell them congruently. Tell them clearly, distinctly, make eye contact, pace them well, and you'll make changes in other people. And your own stories you know inside out because they really happened. Okay, let's move on to the next question, which is from Andy. And Andy didn't provide his location, so we'll just call him Andy. Um, the question is, does self-hypnosis ever not work on someone? Can someone have such an active, logical, analytical mind that they simply cannot get past those analyzing thoughts about what's being said and whether, quote-unquote, I'm under? And yes, recognizing under is a stage hypnosis term, but whatever. Um as a follow-up, I emailed back and forth with Andy for a bit, and he had tried CDs from another hypnotherapist, uh -oh. and, and he found it, in his words, particularly irritating that she would repeat certain suggestions three times in a row, and he just found that got on his nerves and increased his his desire to just pay attention to the content, and it, and it frustrated him that he didn't seem to be able to let himself relax, even though physically relaxing wasn't a problem for him. So let's talk about that a bit. Can people ever not be able to do self-hypnosis? Oh, yeah. I mean, there certainly will be cases like that. I mean, we're what we're running into here based on Andy's example is very, very old school hypnosis where it's believed that everything has to be repeated three times and it becomes just annoying after a while. There's a stage hypnotist who I, I won't mention um, his name at any rate, but his whole thing is in threes. Obviously, he's being taught or read somewhere. Everything's got to be threes. You're getting very tired this evening, very sleepy tonight, very sleepy this evening, very tired tonight, very tired this evening, very sleepy tonight, very sleepy this evening, very tired. Three times. Everything is three times. You're going deep asleep. You're going deep asleep. You're going to sleep. You're yeah, starting to relax, starting to relax, starting to relax. Like over and over and over. And you drive people nuts after a while, to use the medical term. You don't have to do this. Um, one of the advantages that I've had is my doctoral thesis was graphoanalytical structure and its relationship to hypnotic states. So in other words, whether we can predict hypnotizability from handwriting and what sort of intervention should be used, and drew the conclusion that you can. If someone is extremely analytical, I will know right away from their handwriting. It's one of the easiest things to see. What you'll see is a lot of sharp-pointed V structures, narrow, sharp-pointed V structures, especially in the small letter M's and N's, and also in the small letter H. And when I see these very sharp V structures built in, I know the person is highly, highly analytical, and they will analyze things to death if you give them half a chance. Now, having said that, that's why one-on-one, -on -one, you can really bypass this by switching the person's attention away from the mind from analysis into the physical body into kinesthetic states and once you do that any good hypnotic system will put you in touch with your physiology instead whether it's through your breathing or senses of relaxation and by doing that you will start to shut down some of the internal dialogue that is coming from over analyzing the techniques themselves which is why one-on-one -on -one, I teach my students to do kinesthetic ambiguity and all of these things that will create an inroad through a leverage induction and then formulate a good hypnotic trance and intervention based upon that wide awake now. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. I mean, I am a highly, highly analytical person coming from a you know math and science type of background. And I know that whenever I'm in hypnosis class, if somebody is doing hypnosis on me and drives my thoughts towards my my feelings of breathing, you know, and, and Chris, you can just notice exactly the rate that you're breathing. That's right for you. Those kind of things help me because there's, there's no way to overanalyze it in a way that will drive me out of trance. If I overanalyze, it'll just get me more and more comfortable with the rate at which I'm breathing. That's a good point. Also with something like be set free fast that we spoke about in the other podcast, when people get stuck and they're not making changes anymore. I don't know if it was Larry Nims who said it or, or somebody else in the program said, get them out of their head and back into their physical body. What are you feeling right now? Where is it? And that's what you use the cue word mm -hmm. on. And by switching back to a kinesthetic system, you'll slow down some of this internal dialogue as well. Okay, Mike, thanks for that answer. Now, let's just move on to the last question before we hear the therapeutic metaphor for podcast number 11. This comes from Mark in Ontario, Canada, and he says, can I listen to hypnosis CDs while sleeping? Well, you can listen to it while sleeping, but it won't have any effect whatsoever. The whole idea of sleep learning is, is tremendously overrated, and uh, we now know that sleep and dreaming is not the best time for taking in new information. I actually subscribe to something called the Human Givens Theory, which is fairly recent, but it's extremely um, thought-provoking, insofar as it states that the REM sleep 
that we experience while dreaming is actually a time for processing um, emotions that are left hanging from the previous day and resetting all the programming inside our heads so that we respond consistently. Really interesting stuff, but it's not a good time for taking in new information. I recommend use hypnosis CDs earlier in the day, at least a couple of hours before bedtime, at least. Otherwise, it's too much like uh, taking a nap before you go to bed. It'll wake you up in the middle of the night. You don't want to disturb your sleep pattern. You know what you said about REM sleep processing emotions? It's interesting because, I, and I don't go to bed pissed off or angry very often but occasionally i think everybody goes to bed feeling a little annoyed at something but rarely do we wake up feeling that same way yeah that's an interesting point and the way our brains process this is through metaphor so these bizarre dreams and that most of which we don't even remember if you trace it back you'll be able to recognize that it is something that was unresolved from the previous day emotionally that is now metaphorically coming out in the dream okay so with that let's take it to the closing metaphor mike Okay, this is the the metaphor of the thin man. Once again, we're drawing from my own personal experience. All of these actually happened, I swear to you. I, In putting this together today and thinking which one I was going to choose, it, I suddenly came to the conclusion that I've had a lot of very weird experiences. Well, this one happened in the late 1980s. I'm assuming it was about 1988. And I had an agent at the time uh, named Harry. Now, Harry worked for a company in Toronto called Chandel, Chandel Productions, I believe it was. And his last name started with a Z, and it was quite long, and I, I never pronounced it, so I always called him Harry Chandel. I think most people did. And he was a good guy, got me a bunch of gigs, doing hypnosis shows here, there, and everywhere. So in the late 80s, he booked me into uh, a bar, a nightclub in Lindsay, Ontario, and he wanted to come up. He hadn't seen my show in a while. So he drove around to my house. Then in my car, my Volvo at the time, we headed up to Lindsay, which is a couple of hours away. And I did the show. Afterwards, we hung around, talked to the owner, got paid. It was getting late. Time to drive back to Toronto. So we started coming back. And it was, I believe, Highway 35, 115. Interesting stretch of highway. Back then, we're talking, you know, quite a while ago, no more than 25 years ago. It was a little more remote than it is now. Now they have the parkway and all, um, much more construction has gone in, but then it was a little more remote and there was some construction going on throughout the road, but there weren't many cars out at night and Harry and I were driving back and I was hurtling along and I came to sort of a chicane where the road narrowed a bit and there were some pylons set up and you could see there was some construction going on there way out in the country in the daytime at any rate, pitch black and forest to our left and just as I slowed down a shade to get through this twisty sort of construction area, immediately someone ran out from the woods to my left and ran directly in front of my car. And it was the weirdest thing. The man was so tall that I couldn't see his head from where I was sitting in the driver's seat. And he was so close to the car. And just as we almost hit him, I just feathered the brake before I could put it on completely. He thrust himself forward with his head back and the car passed under his back. And Harry said, what the hell was that? Did you hit him? And I said, no. He said, we didn't hit anybody. He said, what was that? I said, I have not got a clue. And we were wide awake all the way home because we had so much adrenaline in our system. And I can't even tell you how skinny this guy was. Never saw his face, but just someone ran directly in front of my car out in the middle of nowhere while I was doing 60 miles per hour. And somehow the car just passed under his the small of his back without hitting him. And I never thought, like, who in their right mind was out there? And why was he so tall and weird looking? So that is the story of the thin man. Well, I think that whole metaphor is going to make the extra music just even more cool for this podcast. <laughs> One would only hope. <laughs> so that wraps up podcast number 11 of Brain Software with Dr. Mike Mandel. I'm Chris Thompson, and we always look forward to getting your questions. E um, you can email them to questions at MikeMandelHypnosis.com. As always, head on over to our website, MikeMandelHypnosis.com. Sign up for our email list where you'll get all kinds of free goodies and explanations and other cool stuff. And head on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating for the show. The more ratings we get, the more popularity we get, and the more listeners we get. And we can help more people with more interesting stories and stuff from the master Mike Mandel. So that's it for podcast number 11. Talk to you next time. And now we're going to hear from the great Austrian information scientist, Dr. Heinrich Dieter, who will sing his new song. Thank you. This is a song about when you wake up in the night 
and you want a lot of time, but the glasses are out of your reach, so you can't see the clock, and your watch is too far away. It goes like this. Why it is that when I wake up, my watch and my glasses are always out of reach. I want to know the time, but I cannot see. I put my hand out for my glasses, but they're always out of reach. Well, let's go back to the other song. (laughs) 